Hello, everyone. Welcome to our virtual event space. So my name is Ali, and I'm your host for this evening. And as much as I wish you were all here in person, we so appreciate you all showing up to support indie bookstores, even online. So tonight, I am so excited to be introducing Becky Chambers and Sarah Gailey here to discuss the first book in Becky's new Monk and Robot series, A Psalm for the Wild Filt. Uh, but before we get into the fun stuff, I just want to quickly thank you all very, very much for tuning in and of course for buying books. So for those of you who may not know, we are an independent bookstore with three locations in the Seattle area and your support really is what keeps us here selling books and we really love what we do. So if you also love what we do, we would so appreciate it if you swing by and grab copies or if you're not local, we of course do ship. I will be linking books in the chat all evening, so they should be super easy to go and find, uh, and we are so, so grateful for your support. So while you are over on the website, I definitely encourage you to check out some of our other upcoming events. We have an exciting roster coming up over the next few months. And if you'd like to stay in touch with our community, you can sign up for our newsletter. It's a weekly update about events and exciting releases and our online book clubs. Uh, we do fun blog posts, etc. And of course, you can follow us on any of the major social media platforms. We are at Third Place Books for the quickest updates and recommendations. So we are here for about an hour and towards the end, we will be taking questions. So if you have any questions, which we very much hope that you do, go ahead and leave those in the Q&A box, which should be either at the top or the bottom of your screen, depending on your device. Um, it is different than the chat box, which is great for virtual applause and connecting with each other. Feel free to let us know where you're from or your latest favorite read. But when it comes time for questions, do make sure sure that those end up in the Q&A box where we can most easily find them. So with that, I believe I have done all of my housekeeping. So without further ado, I am so thrilled to introduce Becky Chambers, the author of the award-winning and third place books favorite Wayfarers series. Her books have been nominated for the Arthur C. Clarke Award, the Locus Award, and the Women's Prize for Fiction, among others. Her newest book, The Psalm for the Wild Belt, is about a tea monk who crosses paths with a nature-loving robot who needs to know the answer to the question, what do people need? This book was staff picked twice by third place booksellers, and I won't read you their whole reviews, but Javi said, this story is a glimmer of hope in our never-ending uncertainty about the future of our world. And Jesse said, we all need this book right now. Um, in conversation tonight, I am so thrilled to welcome Hugo Award-winning and best-selling author Sarah Gailey, who has been published by Mashable, The Boston Globe, Vice, The Atlantic. They won a Hugo Award for Best Fan Writer. Their debut novella, River of Teeth, was a 2018 finalist for both the Hugo and Nebula Awards. Their best-selling adult novel debut, Magic for Liars, was a 2020 Locus Award finalist for Best First Novel and another huge third place bookseller favorite. And their newest book, The Echo Wife, is a domestic thriller in which a man cheats on his wife with her clone, which I just started and it is truly so, so good. So thank you both so very much for being here. I'm so excited to listen in on this conversation. If you need anything, of course, let me know. I will be listening. And of course, the same goes for all of you in the chat. I see you. I see you. Hello. Oh my gosh, Mississippi, Sacramento, Idaho. Oh my goodness. Um, I will be in there. If you need anything, give me a shout. And with that, I'm going to pass the stage to our authors. So welcome, both of you. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. And Becky, thank you so much for uh, coming and talking with me about this amazing book tonight. I am so crazy about Psalm for the Wild Built. I got the incredible opportunity to read it early. Um, and I remember reading it then and going, oh my God, this book is essential. It's everything I need. And then I reread it in preparation for this event. And I was like, oh no, this book is still everything I need. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to read it and to talk to you about it tonight. Oh, I'm so excited. I, I'm, I'm absolutely over the moon about it. So thank you so much. <laughs> I really appreciate that. <laughs> so would you like to introduce our beautiful audience to this beautiful book um, with a reading? 
Yeah, I would, I would indeed. I would indeed. So um, I'm going to start just a little, a little bit of the way in. I will give you the briefest of, of context for this, and then I'll read you a little snippet. Um, so this takes place on a, a moon called Penga, in which um, centuries ago, uh, robots which staffed, for lack of a better word, um, but they, they were the ones who worked in all the factories and they gained sentience en masse and uh, decided to go off into the wilderness and leave um, human civilization behind. Centuries later, Panga has evolved into a, a uh, ecologically harmonious, very sustainable sort of society. Um, and within that, uh, we have uh, this, individual named Sibling Dex, who is a monk, and uh, for reasons that take place in, in this part of the book, um, they have gone off alone and are currently camping in the woods um, when they meet something rather unexpected. Dex tried to process the, the thing standing in front of them. Its body was abstractly human in shape, but that was where the similarity ended. The metal panels encasing its frame were stormy gray and lichen dusted, and its circular eyes glowed a gentle blue. Its mechanical joints were bare, revealing the coated wires and rods within. Its head was rectangular, nearly as broad as its erstwhile shoulders. Panels on the sides of its otherwise rigid mouth had the ability to shift up and down, and shutters lit at its eyes. Both of these features were arranged in something not entirely dissimilar from a smile. Dex realized slowly, still naked, still dripping, I should have mentioned they just showered, that the robot wanted them to shake its hand. Dex did not. The robot pulled back. Oh dear, have I done something wrong? You're the first human I've ever met. The large mammals I'm most familiar interacting with are river wolves and they respond best to a direct approach. Dex stared all knowledge of verbal speech forgotten. The robot's face couldn't do much, but it managed to look confused all the same. Can you understand me? It raised its hands and began to sign. No, I can, Dex realized they instinctively begun signing along with their spoken words and stopped. I can hear, they managed to say. I, uh, um, the robot took another step back. Are you afraid of me? Uh, yeah, Dex said. The robot crouched, trying to align itself with Dex's height. Does this help? That's more condescending than anything. Hmm. The robot straightened up. Well then, allow me to assure you. I mean you no harm, and my quest in human territory is one of goodwill. I thought that much would be obvious from the parting promise, but perhaps that was presumptuous of me to assume. The parting promise. Some distant synapse fired, some speck of knowledge learned once in school and never learned again, but Dex was too shaken to make the connection. Before a link could be forged, another problem registered. Dinner was burning. Shit. Dex scurried to the stove to found the, find the multicolored vegetables turning a uniform black. The robot walked up behind them. This is cooking, it said happily. It's very exciting to see cooking. It was cooking, Dex said, scrambling for tongs. Now it's a mess. They began to rescue their meal, evacuating the salvageable bits onto a plate. Can I help? The robot asked. Can I bring you something that would help? Dex's brain made the laborious shift from what is happening to fix it. My towel, they said. Your towel. The robot looked around. Where Dex jerked their head directionally as they scraped char from the bottom of the pan. In the wagon, on the hook, by the ladder, it's red. The robot opened the wagon door and leaned as much of itself as it could inside. Belongings! Oh, this is a delight. And you have so many and all over. Towel, Dex shouted as one of the better looking veggies tumbled off their plate and into the dirt. The disconcerting sound of rummaging emanated from the wagon as the robot navigated the too small space. A metal arm was extended around the corner, fluffy red fabric in hand. This? Dex grabbed the towel and wrapped it around themselves. 
They stared despondently at what should have been a delicious dinner. They looked down at the clumps of moistened dirt that had collected on clean skin through the holes in their sandals. A blood suck landed on their bare shoulder. They slapped it irritably. Sorry, Dex said to the remains of the bug as they wiped it on a kitchen cloth. The robot noted this. Did you just apologize to the blood suck for killing it? Yes. Why? It didn't do anything wrong. It was just acting in its nature. Is this typical of people to apologize to things you kill? Yeah. Hmm, the robot said with interest. It looked at the plate of vegetables. Did you apologize to each of these plants individually as you harvested them or in aggregate? We don't apologize to plants. Well, why not? Dex frowned, opened their mouth, then shook their head. What, what are you? What is this? Why are you here? The robot, again, looked confused. Do you not know? Do you no longer speak of us? We, I mean, we, we tell stories about, is robots the right word? Do, do you call yourselves robots or, or something else? Robot is correct. Okay, well, it's kids' stories, mostly. Sometimes you hear somebody say they saw a robot in the Borderlands, but I always thought it was bullshit. I know you're out there, but it's like, it's like saying you saw a ghost. Well, we're not ghosts or bullshit, the robot said simply. Rare sightings have certainly occurred in both directions, but there hasn't been actual contact between your kind and mine since the parting promise. Dex's frown deepened. You're saying that you and I are the first human and the first robot to, to talk to each other since everything. Yes, the robot beamed. It's an honor, truly. That's where we will leave it. I wish that I could see the room full of people applauding because I know that they all are individually in their homes right now. Um, so just know is the noise that I'm hearing from the, the vibes in the chat. I love that passage of this book. Um, it, it, I think, really shines. It's a beautiful one to choose for a reading. And I also just have to say, every time I've revisited it, I cannot help but think that that moment where Dex loses all power of speech at this creature that has appeared before it and is expressing interest in them is exactly how I felt when I met my first girlfriend. <laughs> I, you know what? I, I, I share the feeling. <laughs> I, know that, I know that feeling intimately. So yes. I am not trying to ascribe or imply any uh, non-platonic relationship to these two, but I, I, I was like, yeah, I get you, Dex. I know, I know that one. <laughs> she was tall too. I know how it feels. <laughs> so thank you for sharing that reading with us. Are you down to jump right in? Because I have so much that I want to talk about. Let's this do it. Book, this book is rich. This book is, um, I feel like this will be an appropriate metaphor that you will not think I'm comparing your book to dirt. I amend the soil in my garden really thoroughly because my soil here is just, it's just trash. And I use earthworm castings and coco coir and mycorrhizal fungus and this thing called fish slurry, which is it's a nightmare for me, but, but my dog yeah. is obsessed with it. And what happens is I, I plant things in the soil and I expect them to do how they always do when I plant things in the soil in my area and immediately die. And instead they flourish. And reading this book, it just, this feels like this extremely rich book that the story flourishes. I feel like I'm flourishing after reading it. I'm going to stop gushing about it and just ask you questions. As that is the loveliest thoughts. compliment. I, I honestly can't think of anything nicer than to have this book compared to dirt. And I mean, that's so serious. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness, because, ooh, that's a gamble. <laughs> okay, um, so the title of this book is A Psalm for the Wild Built, and a, a studious reader might catch a little hint in there that this book, which is about a monk, contains a religion. Does, yes. And it, it contains, it's one of my favorite things, is a completely fabricated religion. It's not a religion that's like space Catholicism or whatever. And so I would love to know how you went about constructing this religion and its traditions for a completely invented world. Yeah, so there were a few different pieces that went into it. Um, the, the first criteria I wanted to meet was, 
that the gods were real. Like that was always my assumption when I was writing this, the gods are real. That's just how this world works. Um, but within that, I didn't want the gods to feel supernatural or to feel like people. I didn't want them to feel like, you know, this sort of peanut gallery up in the clouds, like pulling all the strings. Um, I, theirs is very much a religion um, based around the world as it exists. The physical, tangible world is what the people of Panga worship and revere. You know, you have these six gods that represent essentially uh, forces of nature. So, you know, biology, natural sciences, uh, you know, physics and, and uh, chemistry. And um, then you have the child gods, which are sort of the lesser gods, which are uh, really more just these these qualities of, of human experience, or not human experience, but of, of sentience, of intelligence, of being able to reflect on the world, of, um, you know, of mystery and comfort and, and of constructs. Um, so I, I wanted it to feel like, in some ways, almost not like a religion at all, because the, the gods don't really care about you. They just sort of exist and inspire, um, but they're undeniable. You know, if, if you were to present forces of nature in our world if you were to 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 wrap them in the packaging of gods you couldn't deny that they exist and so that was um a big piece of it for me was that since this was a book about um you know that takes place in this very uh you know ecologically interconnected world that that's what they're spiritually connecting to as well i think it's so common um to have you know science and religion presented as opposites and in so many different ways in this book I wanted to take opposites and put them together you know nature and technology work together here and so do science and religion um, and so that those were those were the various ingredients that went into the pagan religion. I love that I, I love the marriage of science and religion especially because and this isn't a spoiler at all this is like right in the very start of the book we see that even though the gods and religion aren't deniable, they're still debatable. There's still a lot of argument about exactly how they work and how they function, which is so scientific um, and so honest to the way that undeniable things are completely up for debate. Yeah, I, it was uh, one of the things that was important to me was to make that there, there is a, um, a god that's not really featured too much in this book, Samafar, which is the god of mysteries and the god of mysteries encompasses both science and art because they're both ways of trying to understand the truth of something, they're just different methodologies. So I think that that ties into what you're saying as well is that you know the, these are not inherently incompatible approaches. They're just different lenses you can see the world through. I love that there's a God of mystery in a world where so much of the, the story that you built in this narrative is driven by interest because you can't, well, you can have a mystery without interest. I guess if you're the kind of person who can just walk by something mysterious, but it really feels like um, like questions and interest are a fundamental part of both the world and the religion and the narrative. Those tie together beautifully. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think for me at least, um, sort of an, an inherent piece of of feeling wonder about the world, of having interest in the world, is knowing that I'll never be able to answer everything. I know that. I will never be fully able to understand it. And I, I'm not sure that we're capable of that. And that's another thing I, I wanted to get in here is that that doesn't scare the people here. There is this, in, this inherent understanding of we're not gonna know in everything. We're never gonna really understand how the gods work. We're never really gonna understand how the planet works, but we're gonna do our best. Um, and, and that that's embraced rather than something that you know makes people existentially nervous. Um, it's it's <laughs> something that I wanted to to um, to bring to the forefront in this. That feels really baked into the setting. Um, Panga is a world kind of divided into places where people go and places where people don't go. And the places where people don't go, per the, the parting promise with the robots, is a lot of wilderness. There's a lot of discussion in this book of a sustainable and respectful uh, relationship between humans and wilderness, which involves a lot of non-engagement. And I would be really interested to know what made you decide to bring that into the book and, and what researching that and building it looked like. Because humans as we are now love interfering with wilderness. It's like our favorite thing to do. Yeah. 
<laughs> um, I mean, for me, the goal was always, you know, the outset was just uh, very simply, I want to write a solar punk book. That's what, you know, I want, that's the sort of story I wanted to tell. And uh, so, yeah, I did a lot of, a lot of research and a lot of digging into um, not just sustainable technology, but also different uh, schools of thought about, um, you know, rewilding and about, you know, the, the purpose of, of the purpose of nature. I mean, the nature just exists, right? And we need it to, we need, you know, we all rely on biodiversity, whether we realize it or not. And it's, it's difficult to conceptualize that sometimes in the way that we live, especially um, living in cities. I do not live in a big city now, but I did for most of my life. It's it's really hard to get that in your head that we are all connected to this giant web. And we, if we deny the other things that have a right to be here a place to live, it all starts to fall apart as we are unfortunately seeing. Um, so one, one of the... Um, ideas I found I found really compelling was um, E.O. Wilson's book, uh, Half Earth, which puts forward the case of we should set aside half of the wor world as wilderness and just leave it. And and it, it is kind of, and I, I, I mentioned this in, in Psalm, that it is kind of a ridiculous equation if you think about it, that we're going to keep half the planet just for us. And yet, um, you know, at the same time with society as it is now, uh, you know, it does feel like this sort of ridiculous goal, like, wow, like half the planet, but uh, other, other creatures have to live somewhere. And, and so that was, that was um, a, a really foundational idea for me that, that you don't have urban sprawl, really, you have these clusters that are surrounded by these massive green belts and these huge forests, and um, that there, there really is this uh, very respectful separation between our space and their space. There's this beautiful uh, passage in the book that is describing one of these clusters um, that just like completely gets, it gets me every time. Um, that's about how even digging into the soil is an intrusion into a whole nother world. And as someone who is very invested in underground worlds, I was like, ooh, that's true. How do we solve that? And then in the next sentence, you're like, here's how. Yeah. <laughs> So part of the way that you've built this world, it, it does include a lot of, I mean, I'm not, I'm not extremely well-versed in rewilding, so I might be using the wrong word, but letting, letting nature take back human spaces, there's a lot of description of what happens to roads and what happens to human spaces when we say, okay, we will actually seed this and not kind of take over. Um, and you also include a lot of discussion of the way that human things um, sort of disintegrate when we're not continuing to build them or continuing to repair them, which is something I'm crazy about. The things that we build that we think of as permanent are not subject, they're, they're, so, they're, so, um, they're so temporary. But there's also a lot of permanence that I, as someone who despises the age of planned obsolescence and disposability that we live in, it makes me really heart sick. And there's this sentence in this book that, I burst out laughing when I read it. It was um, referring to a computer and it said like all computers is built to last for a long time. And that's so, it just struck me. That's so different from anything that I even conceive of in the world. Whenever I watch like a science fiction television or show, the computers are like, this thing is gonna break in 10 seconds. That's gonna be so smudged. And if you drop it in your spaceship, it's gonna shatter. I would love to know how computer repair and longevity and robotics repair and longevity came into this story and and how you made them so central to the narrative. Um, I'm, so, I'm so delighted you're asking this question. A lot of it comes from just like a personal bee in my bonnet I've had for so long where I'm like so tired of constantly buying a phone because, you know, and, and I'm always saying like, I want the Model T of computers. Like I want, I want like a, something that weighs a hundred pounds that's going to last for 200 years. I want it to come with a wrench and I just want it to work, <laughs> you know? Hand um, cranked, diesel power. Hand diesel cranked, power. you know, exactly. Power. Um, I think it's really backwards the way that we treat so many different materials, but especially, you know, the fact that I am talking to you through uh, a laptop that is six years old. And the other day I was thinking about like, oh, I wonder if I'm going to have to replace it soon, but it's made out of all these like 
precious toxic materials, you know, and it's, 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 it's completely bonkers the way we treat it. And so this too went hand in hand with how do I make the society as, as sustainable as possible for things like buildings and building materials. They don't, you know, as you noted, they don't really build out of, um, uh, metal anymore. They're, they're building out of wood and out of cob and out of um, like mycelium brick, things that they can regrow. Um, but when it comes to computers, there's not really, or at least in this world, you know, there, there isn't really another way to do it. Um, so I wanted to treat extracted material as the most precious thing. If it's something that you cannot regrow, if it's something that cannot be replenished, you need to treat it, um, I was going to say like gold, but that is like, that's a terrible <laughs> so you know what I mean? And so, um, but yeah, you, you need to treat it as the incredibly rare resource that it is. And especially if it's something that can't be recycled, that means you have to continue using it because you can't, you can't return it to the, the ecosystem. Um, so yeah, um, it, it's customary on Panga for people um, who to to give uh, your your pocket computer. That's a that's a traditional coming of age gift you get when you're 16 is your pocket computer, and it's going to be with you your whole life. Um, you know, you'll have to get it probably repaired. You might need to get it polished up, but it's going to last you forever um, because mm -hmm. you you can't grow another one of those. I really appreciate how much that centers a pocket computer as a practical tool um, as opposed to the center of all commerce and entertainment and thought. Yes. That they are in our world because when I think about a computer lasting a lifetime, I'm like, what about the updates? Is, right. that, is the hardware <laughs> going to be able to support the firmware? And then I'm like, oh, the only reason that I would need those updates is if life was constantly trying to expand to fulfill some capitalist nightmare of right. constant growth. And if you don't need that, then yeah, like the, the same wrench that my grandfather used works for the things I need a wrench to do now. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, and that's so restful for me to think about. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, oh, that would be so relaxing. <laughs> well, and a piece of it too, now, now that you've brought this up, is that I, again, with that sort of marriage of traditionally opposing ideas, I, I did want to make it clear that this is a high-tech society. I think often when we paint pictures of um, sustainable futures, they tend to be very low-tech or very, um, and I don't mean that disparagingly, but they tend to be very sort of back to the land sort of mentality, which these people have in a very literal sense done. But I, I wanted to make it clear that you, you still can have computers, you still can have satellites, you still can have, um, you know, all, all of the, the modern convenience that we love. It just doesn't have to be um, this disposable thing that eats up all of your, your, your mental bandwidth all the time. You know, it, it's, it's supposed to be a tool. It's not supposed to be um, this thing that consumes you, you know, um, and that can absolutely go hand in hand with a world that works in concert with nature. I think that does such a brilliant job of kind of unweaving something that often is in these, uh, in utopian, utopian societies and literature and in solar punk um, literature that's focused on sort of going back to the land, which is that maintaining technology keeps this from being an ableist, fascist utopia. Mm -hmm. People who need assistive and adaptive technology can still live on this planet and thrive and be welcome. And it's not a situation where it's like, oh, well, I guess, you know, like, I don't know, your family has to carry you on a litter made of sticks and linen. <laughs> from place to place, you can still live your life, which I think is, I just think is lovely. I think about it a lot as someone who needs a lot of technology to be able to, you know, do this physical do stuff. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Stuff. Yeah, I think, I think it's very reductive to say that all technology is harmful. I think it erases everything you just said. And I think it also ignores things like, say, um, predicting severe weather or getting information about I don't know, a pandemic out and about, you know, like that, there, there are, there are serious benefits to, to, um, to internet technology that, that I think we take very much for granted now. And so when we do start to think about, you know, like a green utopia, a solar punk utopia, and we strip all those things away, I think what we really should be doing is saying, 
well, maybe it's not the technology's fault. Maybe it's the people who are controlling it and the ways that we're using mm. it. That's the problem because it ultimately is just a tool. It's what we do with it that that causes issues. That's so wild. It's almost like you're saying that like, like tech billionaires being in charge of our entire life and society and the economy and culture is a bad idea. It's, I mean, I know that's a, that's a hot take, but yeah, I, wow, it's spicy. I, I, <laughs> Okay, so speaking of not having tech billionaires, um, I would love to talk to you about Utopia in general. I had an editor who I worked with a little while ago who sat me down once to talk about Utopia for this book that they were writing. And the thesis of the book is that Utopia is impossible in literature and that people simply will not have it. And Psalm for the Well Built is a refutation of that entire thesis. His notion for this book that he was writing is that utopias are impossible because in a utopia, you cannot have personal dissatisfaction and thus there can be no interest in conflict or narrative movement. And Psalm for the Wild Built features what to me is a utopia. I know that there are some utopia nerds out there who would argue with me because they've got a very narrow definition of it. But this is a world that is as sustainable and equal as any I've ever read um, and is a very joyful and thoughtful world where people are existing in a state of harmony that is completely alien to me as someone who lives in America in 2021. And yet the narrative is completely driven by a personal dissatisfaction. And I would love to know how you married those two concepts um, because that editor would have told me that that's impossible. <laughs> you know, it actually, again, stemmed from just the, the original, very simple notion of I want to write a solar punk story and then I sat around being like okay so, so what 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 does that mean and um and I thought about it and I was like well I, I ran into that problem of okay well if everything works what's what's the story and I I have a bone to pick with the idea that like something has to be wrong in order for a story to happen like it you know the, nothing has to necessarily break but you do have to have some tension you do have to have like things to figure out and I realized the more I sort of beat my head against this, that that was the story. The story is, if you have everything you materially need, what do you still need on top of that? If, if all of your, 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 your needs as a, as a complex creature are taken care of and society is, is, you know, just chugging along and doing fine and there's not massive inequality there, you know, there, there are small problems and there are things that need ironing out, but there's, there's nothing super grim what do you still need? And, and that is the, the central question of the book, um, which, so I, I, can't, I can't say too much more <laughs> because that's the book. Um, but I, th I think, you know, it, it, it kind of goes, you know, on a personal side of it. So that's sort of the, the like, the high concept side. I think on the personal side of it, one of the things I was drawing from, and, and you'll probably relate to this, um, you know, 10 years ago or so before, um, you know, before I got published, it was this, you know, I was scraping by as a freelancer. And, um, you know, I, I had this feeling of if I can just write a book, you know, if I can just write a book, I'm not going to feel this anymore. I'm not going to have this feeling of like, you know, I'm, I'm a failure. I'm not making anything good. You know, all of those, you um, sort of, uh, you know, negative thoughts that, that all of us, I think, have about ourselves. If I can just do this, I'll prove to myself that I can do something. And uh, I did that. And then it was like, well, I'm still, I'm still, I'm still feeling this. Oh, the second book, once did I wrote- Did it solve two, everything? It did not solve everything. It did not solve everything. And then I wrote a second book and a third book and a fourth book, and I still wasn't feeling it. And the book started selling well, and I was no longer a, a struggling freelancer. And, you know, I, my, my life became much more comfortable and I still have all of that, you know? So I think that too was something that played into it as well, because I think that that's a very human experience to think that if I just have this, everything's going to be okay when really it's not, you know, not to get too fluffy about it, but it's rarely an external thing. It's more of an internal thing. And so that's, that is very much the, the thing that Dex is wrestling with um, throughout this book. I think it's, it's really beautifully humane to make space for that sense of like lingering soul hunger as just being a part of a human experience, because there are so many ways that 
our society on so many levels tries to exploit that feeling and say, yes. you can solve that if you get a Peloton. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, C.S. Lewis called it the God-shaped hole, and a lot of contemporary megachurches exploit that concept. Mm -hmm. um, Twitter, I think, exploits that concept. Um, for me personally, like 85 times a day, every day, where I'm like, I'm not going to go on the app, and Twitter hisses in my ear, if you go on the app, that place that's empty inside you will feel full. We're going to give um, you some dopamine. It's going to be nice. <laughs> and I'm like, no, you won't. Get away from me. <laughs> I'm still trying. I'm, I'm getting clean one day at a time from Twitter. Um I think that it's really beautiful to make room for that being just a, a human experience. Also, I'm seeing just a little thing in the chat that when I said you can solve this feeling if you get a Peloton, it showed up in the auto captions as if you get a Pelican, which I do actually think would work. But um, at the so zoo, true. they tell me I'm not allowed. It's really unfair. It's I know. Really unfair. You could be in a utopian society if they would just let me have the Pelican. Just follow your bliss, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> Part of this utopia that you built, um, and again, this is not a spoiler given that it's the premise, which is something that I often end up saying when I'm talking about my own book, um, is that robots are no longer in a state of service to human beings. Right now, the world that we live in, robots perform services for us constantly, all the time. I have a little robot. Um, robot. It's like this big that goes around my house sucking up filth from my floor all day long. Mm -hmm. And I don't really ask him if he likes doing that because he doesn't have the sapience to answer. But of course, in this book, the robots develop the sapience and say, we will not be doing that anymore. Um, and the culture that you've built replaces that robot service with human service. And again, this is totally alien to me living in the capitalist nightmare that we currently inhabit. But that human service isn't compulsory. It's, it's voluntary. Um, unless there's like, off the page sweatshops that you haven't told me about. They're not off the page totally fit with the vibe, but you know, I don't want to tell you about your own book. Um, I'm so interested in what happens in this story when the compulsory is replaced by the voluntary um, and the kind of impersonal service is replaced by the personal. I would love to know more about what drove you to that. I, I, th I think you touched on a lot of it just in, in your setup of the question of, of you know, this whole idea of, um, you know, if we, if we get rid of money, nobody's going to want to work, right? Like that whole concept, if there, if there isn't some sort of incentive, nobody's going to want to work. And the, the, what that actually, the way that actually translates is um, nobody's going to want to work in terrible, meaningless jobs if you get rid of it. And that's what people are actually scared of, right? Is that you're, everybody's going to quit the terrible, meaningless jobs. And so I think um, a, a big piece of building this society was that jobs had purpose. There is purpose in service. It, you can see the benefit of what it's doing and all of it is valued. You know, it, there, there is no concept of um, sort of, um, you know, working class versus white collar jobs. All of them benefit society and, and they benefit each other, you know. And so within that, um, you know, it's it's not really seen so much as like, oh, I have to, you know, go to a, you know, everybody does have to work and it's not always fun, but like you're doing something, you're building something together. And so that sense of this is necessary and it's satisfying is enough, you know, and people are going to do that. You know, nobody's just gonna sit around and starve because like, you know, at some point you're hungry and you have to go to all the fields. Like that's just how it works. Um, so so yeah, every everything you brought up there is me um, just kicking back against that idea of, you know, it, it has to exist exactly as it does here or else people are just gonna sit around and be lazy, et cetera. And that too, that whole concept of laziness right, of idleness being, um, you know, like sinful or being a, uh, you know, an undesirable trait. The main character is is a monk of, um, who's a disciple of, of the god of small comforts. Like their, their whole faith is based around, you need to rest and you need to enjoy the world and you need to enjoy the tangible things around you. There's, there's nothing wrong with hedonism here. It's not even really presented that way. It's just enjoy things because they're here for you to enjoy because you are finite and you are precious and the world's beautiful and you should touch it and feel it and taste it and, and, you know, embrace it for all that it is. That's the most beautiful philosophy of idleness I think I've ever heard <laughs> in my life. I, I have been thinking nonstop about something that someone said to me the other day, which is that, um, 
capitalism tries to make human beings into like hive insects, but really we're persistence predators. So it is the most natural normal thing in the world for us to want to just lie around when we're not eating or pursuing prey like that's that's what we do. And I put that together with um, the existence of Minecraft when I think about like idleness and work and how much we intrinsically pursue work when we're passionate about what we're doing. And when there's not something to be passionate about, we're like, oh, you know what sounds good? Sitting around a little bit. Sitting around a bit, yeah. Sitting around a little bit does sound really great. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, you know, speaking as a beekeeper here, I would like to say something about hive insects as well, which is that bees sleep. Um, bees, yeah. I, bees, I shouldn't be surprised by this. I feel like such a bees dumb sleep, by that. and they're really cute when they do it because you can see they're in, they don't have eyelids, so they can't close their eyes, but they're antennae droop. Um, <laughs> yeah. And if they're tired while they're out foraging, they'll sleep in flowers, and they'll go find a leaf to go sit on, and they'll nap. Like we think of them as just these like mindless automatons that go and go and go and go. They sleep. And um, and they know when they need to rest, and they and they keep each other warm is the thing. At night they all cluster together, and in the winter you can't open the boxes because it's too cold out, and they're all balled up together, keeping each other alive through their own heat. You know, like that. That's what a hive insect is. So it's it's we're not even, you know, capitalism isn't just trying to make us into that because that too is a cooperative society. Um, that doesn't resemble what it is we're being forced into here. I'm going to go ahead and never recover from the image of a sleepy bee's droopy antennae. They're That's really how cute. I feel at the end of the day, too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think we have time for one more of my questions before we move on to the audience chat. And I haven't peeked into the Q&A, but I see a healthy, um, like, like when a bee's saddlebags are covered in pollen, I see a good amount of pollen on that Q&A. But first, I'm going to just say, ask you one last thing for me, because I'm greedy and I want all the answers. Um, all of your books that I have read, which I think is all of them that are out, contain really frank and straightforward inclusion of sex and sexuality. And this isn't, like, that by itself is not notable. There's sex in a lot of books. Um, I don't know if any of you have heard of books, but they do have sex in them they often. often. Sometimes, yes, it's true. <laughs> your books are really unique. To me, in that the inclusion of sex and sexuality somehow matrix dodges every Western cultural bullet of like our weird social mores around sex and sexuality. It's part of what I think makes your book so inviting. And so I would love to know more about that philosophy of narrative that you bring um, and the way that you allow your characters to be human in that way. For me, it's it's extremely simple. Um, I write futures that I want to live in. I write futures that I, as a queer person, that my friends as queer people would be welcome in and effortlessly so. And for me, it's just refuting everything that has ever bothered me about <laughs> existing as a queer person in the real world. You know, um, it, it really doesn't matter what setting we're talking about. I, I, I never have people um, need to come out there is no need because there is no assumption of heterosexuality. Um, I, there's no rigidity in it either. There is an assumption of fluidity. There is an assumption of people just are who they are and they're going to bring home whoever they bring home. And, and that all different sorts of families and ways of expressing love are equally valid, you know, and, and that's why I also, I don't just focus on um, sex within the, you know, within, um, you know, romance, but also sex for its own sake, or love expressed platonically, or, um, you know, th there, there are so many different permutations of love and family that exist in reality, and so I, I, I do put a lot of effort into making sure I include um, as many examples of those as possible because they're all worthy, you know? And so to me, it's it's both something I put a lot of thought into, but also something I, I really don't think about at all because it, it's just, I just write where I wanna be, you know? And um, and and I, I want it to be clear to the reader that, that whoever you are, you are, this is a future that is safe for you. This is a future you would be welcome in. Um, 
And so it's just it's just a matter of making sure that whatever issues the characters do have with each other, that they're extremely individual and they're based in, you know, how, how those characters interact with each other. It's not based on any of the rest of it. Um, so yeah, it's both complex because there's a lot of moving parts, but also just the most simple thing in the world. I love that. And that, that notion that no form of love or affection is the best or worst one, mm -hmm. um, I think is why I always, when I'm describing your books to people and this comes up, I do always describe this as frank because it's not like sex and sexuality is the most important kind of affection or romance that you can express. And it's not like it's the least important. Um, it's, I love that it's right up there with friendship and familial relationships. Um, I think that's, I just think it's lovely. Thank you. Thank you. And in, in Psalm, especially, I wanted to make it clear one that like the religion isn't, um, you know, opposed to sex, like Dex is a monk and, and they, they definitely have sex, you know, when, when they when they want to. Um, but also that that too is a small comfort. It's not treated as, as um, you know, something that's sort of lofty and, and you know, idealistic. It's, it's presented in the book as casual as, uh, not that it can't be meaningful as well, but it's on par with a comfortable bed or a cup of tea or a sunny day, or, you know, it's, it's part of human experience and should be treated as something wholesome because it is. I love you drawing the parallel between um, sex and a comfy bed because as someone who, it, you know, generally speaking enjoys both, there's a line in here that a bed that is created is based on a, another monk's volume, a treatise on beds. Yes. <laughs> and I, part of my disabled life is really trying to make my bed as comfortable as possible because I spend a lot of time in there and comfortable in a way that's like good for my body and I immediately was like give me the treatise <laughs> <laughs> all right well do you feel ready to answer some questions from our fantastic audience absolutely all right I am going to make sure that I'm, I want us to try to get to as many as possible but there's a lot so I'm sorry friends we might not get to all of them but I'm just gonna take a quick scan to see which ones I can combine because there might be some that go together. I was right, good instincts passed me. <laughs> um, so a couple of people are interested in the auditory landscape that you surround yourself with when you're writing. Um, one person noted that the soundtrack for the video game Journey fits this book very nicely. And people are just wondering what you listen to and what generally your routine is when you're writing. And we so, are writing this um, I love that you brought up journey, that whoever it was brought up journey because um, I, I do listen to a lot of game soundtracks when I write. Um, I find them really conducive to writing. One because they don't have lyrics. I can't ever listen to anything with lyrics in them because it, it kills my ability to words. Um, but um, they're also, you know, they're they're very. They tend to be very ambient, very soothing, and also very repetitive, which is really nice when I'm writing. Journey is not one I used for this because I've used it for another book. I tend to not listen to the same soundtracks over and over again because I start to associate them with specific projects. Um, for song, I actually often I just open my balcony window because there's birds out in the in the trees outside so I would just sit and listen to the trees and the birds while I was writing and that was that was nice. If I was listening to music um, it would usually be either some sort of like chill hop playlist so you know lo-fi beats to study to, et cetera. <laughs> um, game soundtracks wise, I, oh, not with this one. So I've re I finished the second one, which I can't talk too much about yet because it hasn't been properly announced, but um, the Outer Wild soundtrack was one that I listened to a lot while I was, um, while I was writing that book. So, um, but I think Jeremy's a lovely choice as well. I am so excited that to hear about the second one that was like my, my, wrap us up question that I was going to ask because there's another <laughs> one on the way and I am so pumped. Um, so we've got a couple of people asking generally about a disability and mental illness. Um, I'm, this person summarizes it really well. The way you write disability is a way I wish everybody did. There's also someone else in the chat who is a therapist and sends their clients to your book to give them ways of imagining outside the bounds of this world. And people are wondering what informs the way that you write um, disability and a world that is friendly to people with mental illness. 
Um, but thank you. First of all, that's, that's an incredible compliment. Um, I, you know, again, it's one of these very simple things in that, um, you know, I'm a person with mental illness. I have uh, anxiety and depression and have my whole life. And, you know, there are things I have to manage and that I struggle with. Um, and a lot of the people in my life fit that bill as well. I also have a, a number of people in my life with um, chronic illnesses or with, you know, various disabilities of, you know, loved ones who are uh, neuroatypical, etc. And that they're just part of my fabric. They're just part of my existence. And so in the same vein of I'm not going to write futures that don't include queer people, I'm not going to write futures that don't include bodies and brains that work differently. Um, because they do. And I don't see that as a bad thing because it's not. It's just bodies and brains are immensely complex and I don't even necessarily see it as things going wrong. It's just the um, impossible to grasp. I, I've already said complex, but I'm going to say again, complexity of biology and mutation and all of it, things work differently. And we have um, the technology and the abilities to deal with a lot of it, not all of it, but with a lot of it. And all we really lack is the will or, or in some cases, the compassion to do so. And so um, that's, I, I, I wish that um, it wasn't a rarity in, in books or in media to have that, because to me, it just seems like the most natural thing in the world. You know, I think it's, um, I think it's wonderful, honestly, that all of us work a little bit differently. I think it's one of the things that makes us beautiful, um, not to get sappy about it, but like, it's, it's true, you know, and, um, and I think especially within a genre like science fiction and fantasy, you know, if you can wrap your head around the fact that, you know, you have aliens that think differently or robots that think differently, what is so hard about the idea that human brains work differently from each other? you know um so yeah that's 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 that in a nutshell <laughs> I think that's that's one of the things that I as a oh deluxe mentally ill and disabled person really love finding in these books is not only space for disabled mentally ill and neurodiverse people but also space for the experience of living as one of those kinds of people to be at times unpleasant because people work differently. Mm -hmm. um, and that unpleasantness not being a deal breaker and not being something that needs to excise people from the story. I, I recently was uh, kind of sitting with someone who I love very much through an intense depressive episode and they happened to read To Be Taught If Fortunate. And there's a scene in that book that for them perfectly encapsulates what they were going through. And they were like, these characters are hurting the way I'm hurting. And that hurt isn't um, uncompassionate in the narrative, which I think is lovely. I'm just being selfish and talking about the thing I like. <laughs> Sorry, audience. <laughs> you, okay. can, you can tell your friend that I know exactly which scene you're talking about and it was written from that. So yes, is, is the short answer. <laughs> it was beautifully done. Um, a, a question that isn't gonna make me cry, hopefully in, the, in how you answer it, is uh, someone wants to know a little bit more about the history of the religion in this book. This religion is so central to the book and it seems to be really based in sustainability. And our audience is wondering if that religion existed before the transition, because it seems that sustainability wasn't as big a part of the dominant culture before the uh, parting promise. So um, my, my internal idea of how this works, and I will, preface this with a caveat, which is that I haven't fleshed out the full history of, of Panga pre-transition. So um, this will be a little flimsy, but um, essentially with the understanding that the gods are real, I think that the religion did exist, but in a very different form. Um, I think there was a very different understanding of how the gods worked. I think they I think they were seen largely as something to be harnessed rather than something that is understood. I think especially in terms of, of the child gods, you know, where you have sort of, you, you could frame them as like god of mysteries can be sort of intellectual pursuits, god of constructs can be industry, uh, small comforts can be things that you can buy. I think that these ideas were, were contextualized 
in a way that very much matches the way that, you know, if you just, if you just buy a Peloton, you're going to feel okay. You know, that sort of idea. I, so I, so the religion existed, but I think it went underwent a dramatic shift, um, during the, uh, during the train or post transition and that the the way that the gods were understood also shifted along with how people started to uh conceptualize uh, our, their role in you know the food web at large within the ecosystem at large much as you know our own view of, of the ecosystem is changing, you know, from this whole like, the, the very Western idea of, you know, sort of dominion over the earth and animals and how all of this is here for us to be used. And, and now, you know, we're slowly, slowly, slowly coming around to the idea that this is all of a, a system that we are a piece of. So I think. slowly, please, can we do it fast? <laughs> can, we, can we hurry it up a little bit? Um, but, um, but yeah, so I, that, that's, that's the shift that happened. And so that affected not just technology, but religion as well. That I love how uh, clearly and cleanly that reflects religion under capitalism. <laughs> Where it, it, it is so easy to reframe a religion as it is to reframe anything to support an exploitative system. Um, I, I love that the grounding of this religion means that it can, it can exist under both and be equally real and true, whether it's being acknowledged or not. Okay, uh, we are pretty close to the end of our time since mm -hmm. you already uh, got the scoop on my originally planned wrap-up question of whether we can expect uh, another book in Song for the Wild Built. I'm instead going to hand it to a fistful of audience members who are dying to know what you've been reading lately and enjoying. Uh, so currently I am reading uh, Emily Wilson's translation of The Odyssey, which I adore. I don't know. I've been super hungry for classics lately, and um, I, I I don't know if that's anyone here's jam because obviously it's not at all what we're talking about. Um, but her translation is absolutely stunningly beautiful. And and if you if you are interested in um, sort of the the ethos that goes into translation at all, I highly recommend it because just her translation notes at the beginning of the book about her entire approach um, to taking this ancient text and making it feel contemporary um, have completely changed the way I think about both classics and translations. So that is, that is the, the tome that is <laughs> I am currently picking through. I have heard so many good things about that. I've heard people talking about that in connection with um, Maria Devana Hidley's Beowulf. Which is also on my shelf. That's up next. Oh my gosh. So. I, I have to know what you think of it. I have heard so many beautiful and brilliant things about both of them. And I love what feels like a revolution that's happening in classics translation right now. Yeah. I, have, I, could, I could talk for an hour about that, but we do <laughs> not have. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that that is uh, pretty much the end of our time. I'm just going to close by talking about a book that I read recently that I that was phenomenal. It's called A Song for the Wild Bill. It's by, <laughs> I don't know if you've heard of them, Becky Chambers, um, author of lots of other wonderful books, including To Be Taught a Fortunate. A Song for the Wild Bill is available now everywhere books are available. That includes third place books where you should buy this book from. Um, if you need to buy a copy from every single independent bookstore in the United States, do that, but get it here first. And if for some reason you also need to buy from independent bookstores online, go to bookshop.org. You can also go to your local library and say, hey, I bought a stack of 12 copies of Song for the Wild Built that I'm donating to you. Please make sure that you add them to your catalog. Do not order them from the bad river man who wants to go to outer space. We don't need to give him money because you can give all of your money to independent bookstores and local libraries near you. Becky, thank so, you so much for doing this with me. No, Andrea. thank you. This, this has been an absolute time. delight. It's been so much fun. Thank you so much. <laughs> Sarah, thank you for doing my job for me. That was <laughs> the best. <laughs> I'm back, everyone. Hello, authors. This has been so, so wonderful. According to abundant feedback from the chat, we laughed, we cried. This has been so, such, such a beautiful conversation. Audience members, truly, you have been an absolute delight. Um, somebody says, can we have a chat with Becky and Sarah every week? This was so brilliant and inspiring and warm. And yeah, what a, yes, absolutely. So I'm going to link this book in the chat one more time. It's been a lot of talking. So there, you can follow it there, off to the book. And 
with that, I think it's time to call it a night. Um, audience members, if you want to come in, we would love to see you. Tell us what you thought of this event. Um, post about it on the internet. Tag us. We love that. We love it when that happens. Becky and Sarah, one more huge, huge thank you. This has been wonderful. And with that, I think it is time that we let the awkward waving commence. <laughs> So awkward waving. No, thank <laughs> you so much. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure. Thank Thanks, you so everyone. much. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. <laughs>